Driving can be great fun, but it also has its own responsibilities. Care not only for your own well-being, but also for the safety of your passengers and other road users. Concern for the general public, the safeguarding of property and protection of the environment. And of course for the vehicle itself, it costs a lot of money. Driving can be a challenge too. If you're on road, it's getting from A to B quickly, safely and economically. And if you're off road, it's getting your vehicle from A to B at all. And that's what this training video is all about. To show you some of the driving techniques that will get the best out of the new Land Rovers. If you're driving on road, defensive driving is the watchword. By driving that way, you'll probably arrive at your destination quicker, but without the stress, squealing tires and wasted fuel. To do this, you must learn the capabilities of this Land Rover and drive to its characteristics. It's heavy, it has a high command position and it's powerful. So you need to find out how it behaves, how it steers, corners and brakes and how to use the gearbox. It has a strong diesel engine which gives lively performance and excellent pulling power. So there's no need to be stirring the gear lever all the time. But having said that, you should still be in the right gear to anticipate situations. For example, if you're driving through a busy town, you shouldn't be chugging along in fifth gear. You ought to be in a lower gear, depending on your speed at the time, ready to anticipate changing traffic conditions. But whatever gear you're in, the gear lever isn't for resting your left hand on. Driving one-handed reduces your chances of successfully taking evasive action if you have to change course suddenly. So, always hold the wheel with both hands at the 10 to 2 position. When you turn a corner, pull it with the appropriate hand in the direction you want to turn. For example, at this right-hand turn, pull it with the right hand and allow it to slide through the left hand. Your Land Rover now has power steering, which means that less effort's needed to turn the wheel. But don't be lulled into a false sense of security and think that you only need to hold the wheel with one hand. As we said just now, you need both hands on the wheel at 10 to 2 for maximum control and for ease of movement if you have to change direction suddenly. Here are some tips when you're driving round bends on the open road. For a left-hand turn, if there's nothing coming the other way, Keep towards the centre line on the approach. It gives you better visibility round a bend. Then, drive towards the kerb as the bend starts to straighten and outwards again at the end of the bend. On a right-hand turn, start near the kerb for maximum angle of visibility, but the same principle applies. Done that way, it doesn't mean you should go around the bend faster, but it does reduce the forces acting on the vehicle. That gives you greater safety because you can see further ahead. And secondly, by increasing the radius of your line round the bend like that, you lessen the braking and acceleration needed because you can maintain a steady speed with reduced tyre wear and better environmental protection. While we're on the subject of driving round sharp bends, use your powers of observation to judge its severity. In urban areas, the position of lamp posts ahead will give you a clue. And on the open road, telegraph poles may help. But take care, because sometimes telegraph poles may suddenly leave the roadside. A good clue is to watch the height of the road edge at the furthest point that you can see. If it moves down relative to your line of vision, it means the bend is tightening up. And when it moves up, the bend is straightening out. So you can vary your road position and speed accordingly. We mentioned just now the powerful engine fitted to your Land Rover. It's a diesel and that should tell you that to drive it for best performance doesn't mean peak revs through the gears. A diesel engine starts to run out of steam well below its maximum speed, so you're much better off changing up at least 500 RPM before you get there. Driven that way, the vehicle will perform better, last longer and use less fuel, with the added benefit of protecting the environment. And don't forget the engine's maximum speed is governed, so, it's best to anticipate the road and use the engine's torque rather than revs to accommodate swift, smooth overtaking. Don't drive too close to the vehicle in front. If you're waiting to overtake, you'll have a better view of what's ahead if you drop back a few yards. 
and you have a better chance of taking smooth, evasive action if he does something unexpected. We haven't talked about brakes yet, a vital part of the vehicle's equipment, but they get taken for granted, and too often absolute reliance is put on them if you get into trouble. But that may be a mistake. A greasy road or a sharp corner being taken too fast and the brakes can't do their job. The result? An accident. Or a tragedy. The vehicle has powerful brakes ready to stop you in an emergency. But the point is, why did the emergency arise? Was it because you were driving too fast, not concentrating or what? It's all too easy to blame others, but the fact remains, if you weren't there, it wouldn't have happened. Remember, if you have to brake hard, it's usually because you haven't anticipated events. You must think ahead, slow down early, and drive at a speed appropriate to the conditions. You'll have a much better chance of keeping control of the vehicle, and the environment will be happier too. Don't forget that Land Rover vehicles are dual purpose, and they're heavier than a normal car, particularly when laden or towing. So, weight transfer and vehicle positioning will influence braking performance. Oh, and by the way, when you brake from higher speeds, a minimal correction at the steering wheel to keep the vehicle in a straight line may be necessary and is normal. One area of driving skills that doesn't get talked about too much is reversing. But in fact, according to MOD statistics, it's one of the highest causes of accidents. So here are a few tips. Reversing can be awkward, particularly in a confined area, so make sure the area is clear of obstructions. And remember, there will be a blind area immediately behind the vehicle. Standing orders require that you're always guided as you reverse. Now there are many hazards when reversing, so move slowly and pay strict attention to your guide. As you steer, the front of the vehicle comes round in an arc and could hit obstructions. The faster you manoeuvre, the more quickly the front moves. If in doubt, engage low ratio for better control. Extra care is required when reversing a trailer. Before we finish this part of the programme about on-road driving, let's have a few words about towing a trailer. Now you've probably seen accidents involving trailers, but why do they happen? Sometimes the cause is a sudden gust of high wind. But what other contributory factors are there? How about tyre pressures, for example, on the trailer? Has anybody checked them recently? If they're low or uneven, the behaviour of the trailer will be affected. But probably the biggest single factor affecting trailer stability is the way it's loaded, particularly on two-wheel trailers. If a heavy load is being carried, and it's all at the back, the rear of the towing vehicle will be lifted up. If it's all at the front, the rear of the vehicle will be pushed down. Well, either way, stability will be badly affected. The vehicle becomes difficult to drive, and control can be easily lost. In fact, your vehicle handbook specifies the maximum load which should be put on the tow bar. It's only 75 kilograms. So always make sure that any load you put into a trailer is evenly spread fore and aft of the axle. When the trailer's loaded, if you can't lift the drawbar, it's too heavy at the front. And if it tries to fly up and hit you in the teeth, well, it's too heavy at the back. A badly loaded or overloaded trailer will try to steer the vehicle, the tail wagging the dog, if you like. At higher speeds, the combination will start to snake and you, the driver, will then find yourself having to take corrective action on the steering wheel. If you overcorrect, the situation will get worse and you can totally lose it. So if you start to snake, slow down until you regain control. And by the way, don't forget that another easy way of losing control is to tow a heavily laden trailer with an empty vehicle. Now this also causes a potentially dangerous imbalance situation. Let's look at what we've said about on-road driving. The word scud sums up good driving. It's a proven fact that speed is the greatest cause of accidents. So keep your speed down unless it's totally safe to go faster. And that's not very often. Conditions. 
only drive in the way that prevailing conditions allow. Unexpected. Always remember that conditions may change unexpectedly. Driving defensively. We mentioned it earlier. It means remembering your responsibilities to your passengers, other road users, the general public, property and the environment. To do this, you have to concentrate on your driving. All the time, give consideration to other road users. Treat them as you would like to be treated. And always allow for other people's inadequacies. Always try to anticipate events. Don't just be looking at the back bumper of the vehicle ahead of you or the road immediately in front of you. Think ahead and look ahead. You're in the fortunate position that your high seating position gives you a better view than the cars around you. So you should look for potential situations developing in front, anticipate events and plan accordingly. Be aware that the unexpected may happen at any time. A slow moving farm vehicle appearing from a hidden gate or a child suddenly coming out from behind a parked car. So always drive within the capabilities of the vehicle and at a speed and in a manner to suit prevailing road conditions. Remember, you may think you're the man when it comes to driving, but your passengers may not. Think ahead and drive smoothly for less wear and tear on the vehicle. In the second half of this program, we're going off-road. But remember, the basic driving techniques we're going to show you are only an introduction to the art of off-road driving. And it is an art, which you can only gain with practice and experience. Before we go off-road, let's remind you of the controls, and in particular, gear changing on your Land Rover. Correct gear selection is possibly the most important factor for safe and successful driving off-road. You've got two levers, this conventional gear change lever operating a five-speed gearbox and this shorter lever which is a combined transfer gear and differential lock lever. It has two functions. One is to provide high and low ranges for the gearbox, move it back to high range for normal on-road use and forward to engage low range so you can drive slowly over difficult terrain with sufficient engine revs. But don't forget you must stop before attempting to change range. The other use of the lever is to engage the differential lock or the diff lock as we call it. Just move it to the left in either high or low range to select diff lock. Use it in slippery conditions such as mud, snow, ice or sand. But never use it on good road surfaces such as tarmac. Always make sure you deselect the diff lock when you move back onto tarmac. This symbol on the instrument panel will illuminate when the diff lock is engaged and it'll only go out when it disengages. If the light doesn't go out, stop the vehicle and drive it in reverse for a few meters to unwind the transmission. As soon as the light goes out, you'll know it's okay to move off. Never drive the vehicle with the diff lock engaged unless it's essential. The steering will be harder, tire wear more severe and it'll put more load on the engine so fuel consumption will suffer. To help you keep out of trouble, it's important that you have an understanding as to what four-wheel drive is, and in particular, what the diff lock does. Have a look at this. In a conventional 4x2 vehicle, drive from the gearbox is via a prop shaft to a differential, and to two wheels only. If one of those two driving wheels starts to spin, the differential action will mean that the vehicle will stop. In a 4x4, there's also a prop shaft from the gearbox to a front axle differential to drive the front wheels too, which greatly improves the available traction in slippery conditions. In the Land Rover 4x4, a third differential is fitted between the two prop shafts. Without the means to lock this differential, it would still be possible to lose drive in slippery conditions. So, that's why the diff lock is fitted. When it's engaged, the differential is locked 
so there'll always be a drive through both prop shafts. Now that you have a better understanding of the gearbox and the diff lock, we'll go off-road and see how to use them properly. Don't take the Land Rover's off-road capabilities for granted. There are few situations that it can't handle, but this depends on the driver's skill and experience to get it through, and that's where you come in. The first point to make is that you have to make sure you're not going to drive into a situation that you can't get out of or drive stupidly and get stuck. You've got to concentrate and you've got to think and plan ahead to anticipate events. That means planning the best route, being in the right gear and driving at the right speed. You must always be in control of the vehicle. Once the wheels start to spin or slide, you've lost it. And if you don't regain control quickly, the situation can soon get out of hand. A golden rule here is to drive with the accelerator pedal and use the clutch and the brake to an absolute minimum. Here are some typical situations you may be faced with and how you should handle them. Take sand or mud, for example. For these conditions, you need to engage the diff lock before you start to get maximum traction and as high a gear as you think it'll take because you don't want the wheels to start spinning. Then cross the difficult stretch on a steady throttle. Don't try hard acceleration. The engine's torque will start the wheels spinning. The grip goes and the wheels start to bury themselves. A similar technique will get you through ice and snow and across wet grass. Just use sufficient engine revs without laboring. Don't turn the steering wheel violently and if you have to brake, do it with care. By the way, one trick you can use if you think a crossing will be difficult is to let some air out of the tires first. But if you do, don't forget you must blow them back up again before you go on road. Remember, underinflated tires will overheat on the road. This will adversely affect vehicle control and could lead to a blowout. Where did he go wrong here? Probably in the wrong gear and too much welly. It's a very steep climb, so plan ahead how you're going to make it. Always try to go straight at the slope rather than diagonally across it. If you do that, you may also lose control because the vehicle will try to slide down or even roll over if it's steep enough. Is the ground reasonably dry or hard? If so, low range second or third gear is probably the answer. Ideally, you want to climb in the highest gear it'll take. But if you choose too high a gear, you'll probably stall. And that's bad news on a hill like this. Build up a fair speed on the approach to the slope so that if it drops off, you'll still have sufficient momentum. Once on the slope, delicate use of the accelerator is necessary to try to eliminate wheel spin. But if the wheels do start to spin, don't floor the accelerator. That will only make things worse. You'll probably start to slide sideways off course. If it's slippery wet grass or mud, Ensure the diff lock is engaged for the extra traction it'll give you. But whatever you do, make your mind up before you start and stick with it. Never try to change gear halfway up. You'll probably stop or stall the engine and the vehicle will want to slide back. If you stall, never try to free wheel back down. You'll lose control. If you get it wrong, stop. With the ignition off, Hold the vehicle on the handbrake and foot brake. Put the vehicle in reverse, release the handbrake, then gently release the foot brake. The vehicle is now held on the braking effect of the engine. Now turn on the ignition. You will start with a jolt, but then be taken back down the slope under control of the engine braking. All you have to do is steer, then try again.
Coming down a slope can be just as tricky as going up, or even trickier, because you may not even be able to see the steepness of the ground over the bonnet as you approach it. Stop a vehicle length before you get to the edge, and if necessary, get out to have a look. Select low range first gear with the diff locked. Let the clutch out and allow the vehicle to descend the slope without touching the clutch or brakes or the accelerator. Let the engine do the braking. Don't try to brake or you'll start to slide and lose control. If the vehicle does slide, very gentle use of the accelerator will get it back under control again. And, just like going up a steep slope, always come straight down, never diagonally. If you do have to traverse a slope, so much depends on its steepness and the hardness of the ground. But if it's steep and slippery, you'll slide sideways towards the bottom. So the first thing to do is to decide whether it's worth trying at all. Crossing ridges or ditches or driving through gullies can make it difficult to keep traction. The excellent Land Rover suspension design allows the wheels to adopt amazing angles to maintain contact with the ground. But obstacles like this do require a bit of thinking out by the driver. Approach it straight on and the front wheels can drop so far that the vehicle will be stopped. Approaching at an angle in low range with the diff locked can make all the difference. Three of the four wheels will always be on flat ground while you cross and traction will be maintained. Incidentally, the least ground clearance is between the ground and the two differential casings. They're located under the driver on right-hand drive Land Rovers and under the passenger on left-hand drive. So, a useful tip is to remember their positions and line yourself up accordingly if you have to steer over large stones or protruding rocks. In deeply rutted tracks, the one thing you don't have to worry about is steering the vehicle. It'll do that for itself. But obviously, you still have to think about the ground you're going to cross and drive accordingly. Don't overlook the potential loss of ground clearance below the axles, because you could leave yourself stranded. If that happens, a useful tip here is to turn the wheels slightly from side to side and use the tyre sidewalls to get traction on the vertical edges of the ruts. We haven't mentioned wading yet, but here too there are important points to remember. The first is to fit the wading plug before you start. It stops water and mud getting onto the clutch, but it shouldn't be left in permanently. If the water's too deep, it can get to the electrical system and into the engine's air intake with immediate serious engine damage. And you can cause the same problem by going into shallow water too fast. Yep, that was a pretty stupid bit of driving, wasn't it? He had no idea how deep the water was and it could have gone into the engine, causing it to seize. Also, the vehicle could have been badly damaged and worse still, he could have caused injury to himself and to his passenger. And all because of a total lack of forethought. If you don't know the water you have to go through, it may be necessary to do a recce on foot to find out how deep it is. But in any case, stop before you get to it, select diff lock low range and a gear which will enable you to keep the revs up and drive through steadily. In deep water, keep your speed down to about three miles an hour to avoid creating too big a bow wave. And make sure you don't stall or water will go up the exhaust pipe. Slow and steady is the way to get through. And don't forget, when you've reached the other side, drive a short distance with your left foot on the brake pedal to dry out the brakes. Otherwise, the next time you need them, they may not work too well. If you're crossing a river, it's best to aim slightly downstream. If you go upstream, a strong current may drown your engine. But however you tackle it, always decide where you can exit the river before you start. Oh, and yes, if you're going through water in convoy, don't get too close to the vehicle in front. The wash he makes may drown your engine too.
Here's a few more tips for off-road driving. Your new Land Rover has a much more powerful engine in it than the last one. So, it'll be much easier to get wheel spin if you over-exercise your right foot. The power is there when you need it, but use it with care. It's all too easy to get wheel spin. Make sure you don't have your thumbs wrapped around the steering wheel, particularly when you're driving off-road. You suddenly hit a major obstacle, kick back through the wheel could give you a nasty thumb strain, or even break it. Keep your foot well away from the clutch pedal when you're not actually changing gear. If you don't, and you hit an unexpected bump, you can declutch inadvertently and lose control. Keep braking to a minimum, and heavy braking is out altogether. On mud, wet grass, snow, or steep downslopes, you'll lose grip, start sliding, and you're immediately out of control. Use the engine to provide braking on a downslope. And similarly, heavy use of the accelerator pedal under these conditions can cause wheel spin and loss of control. Make sure you can pass through tight areas by being aware of the vehicle's dimensions, height, width and length. And by the way, in tight spots you can judge distances more accurately by keeping to the right. Less obviously perhaps, you must be aware of the approach, departure and ramp angles of your vehicle. As you can see, these are the clearances you have at the front, rear and underside, and the maximum angles of the obstacles that you can clear without grounding. And don't forget the effect your driving techniques can have on the environment. Heavy braking and hard acceleration all play their part in polluting it. To sum up off-road driving, there are few hard and fast rules because each situation has to be assessed on its merits. But see how you can measure up to this. Never change gear or operate the clutch while you're going through a difficult patch of ground. Make your mind up about gear selection before you start and stick with it. From then on, the only pedal you should use is the accelerator. Experienced off-road drivers look and plan ahead. They drive smoothly. They treat loose or wet surfaces as if they're ice and do everything gently. Smooth, slow throttle operation to keep the tires from spinning on acceleration and from locking on deceleration. They use precise steering and they remember the golden rule. Drive with the accelerator pedal and use the clutch and brake as little as possible. The experienced driver always controls the vehicle, never the other way round by driving as slowly as possible, but as fast as necessary. Done that way, they get through. Can you? Anticipate by looking ahead for potential hazards and thinking ahead. Prepare to drive accordingly by selecting the route and the right gear ahead of time. Remember the specific technique you need to cross that type of obstacle and drive through or over it accordingly. Keep in control at all times. If you lose it, you may have more than just a red face. As part of the MOD's and Land Rover's commitment to environmental protection and to reduce the admission of greenhouse gases and harmful particulates, you must drive in a way that protects the environment. The techniques for drivers to minimize fuel consumption through better driving are summarized in standing orders for drivers. JSP 341 Part 4. These techniques offer significant financial savings in reduced fuel consumption, in addition to assisting the MOD to meet its demanding targets for reducing harmful emissions. Your training will have taught you to drive safely. These actions will help you to drive safely and economically. By the way, a final thought before we finish. We talked earlier about the powerful engine fitted to your new Land Rover. It's turbocharged, and turbos turn at incredible speeds, well over 100,000 revs per minute. And this means that their bearings must get plenty of pressurized oil from the engine. This oil drains from the bearings when the engine's stationary. So when you start up, let the engine idle for a few seconds before revving it. Well, this will allow pressurized oil to get to the turbo. 
equally important is switching off. If you rev the engine and immediately switch off, the engine will stop, but the turbo will continue to spin while it slows down. The result can be damaged bearings and an expensive turbo replacement, because when you switched off the engine, the supply of pressurized oil to the bearings was immediately cut off, long before it stopped turning. So, always allow the engine to idle for a few seconds before turning it off. Well, that completes this program. We've shown you techniques for both on-road and off-road driving to help you get the best out of your Land Rover. There's been a lot for you to think about, and you may want to watch this video again, either now or later. But the proof of the pudding is to try and put into practice the things we've shown you, to make you a safer, more proficient driver. Maybe one day you will justifiably be able to call yourself an experienced driver. Good luck.